Sabbath, everyone. Pleasant Sabbath to you and everyone else. Those on online, those are online, those are online guests. morning we are going to have a word of prayer and uh, we're going to ask Sister Viola Watson to pray for us this morning. Sister Viola. like to let you know that uh, you can participate in our uh, discussion this morning by putting your comments on your questions in the chat on YouTube or Facebook. All right, we are going to answer your questions, if not immediately, uh, we can answer your questions at a later date. Also, 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 okay, also at the also end at of end our of study our this, study this uh, morning, you are welcome to participate in the Sabbath School Quiz. Uh, just text the word SS Quiz uh, to 855-997-1170. Uh, click on the link that pops up and give us the answers to the quiz. Uh, we, this quiz is uh, give a summary of the lesson. Uh, it's, you know, so it can help, especially those who did not get a grasp of what the lesson is all about. The Sabbath School quiz can uh, wrap up, give you a, a quick wrap up of what the lesson is all about. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, this Sabbath, this week, really, we were studying about another aspect of the Psalms. If you know this quarter, we are, we are studying the book of Psalms. And the topic is a very interesting topic this week. Singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Singing the Lord's song in a strange land. And the memory text taken from Psalms 137 and verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's it. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Brothers and sisters, family, guests, our study this week focused on questions that all true followers of God ask themselves at one time or another in their Christian journey. And our memory text set the tone of those questions. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? In other words, how can we worship God when there is so much evil and wickedness around us? How? Or why we who are children of God suffer so much 
Why? Or how shall we worship you, Lord, when you seem to be absent because of your silence? How can we worship you when you are silent and don't seem to answer our, our call and prayer? How, Lord? Oh, why? Why should we worship you when we see the prosperity of the wicked and the unrighteous people? When we see how they are prospering? These are questions that trouble us as we seek to follow our God. <laughs> I'm very happy to say, to say that our loving God provide answers to this question in his word. <laughs> there is a Bible text that says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. As a matter of fact, the answers of the answers for all of life's question is in his word. The answers for all of life's question is in the word of God. Amen? <laughs> so let us uh, proceed to see if we can answer some of those questions. Our panelists are here and waiting. <laughs> and uh, our first question is going to go uh, to Sister Love. <laughs> Sister Love, this question is for you. Should God's children be exempt from the suffering of this world? If not, what should be their attitude towards God when they go through trying times? Sister Love? Amen. <laughs> Good morning and happy Sabbath. I have the Monday lesson. It said, a deaf door. So before I begin, let me let me start with this. It said, many psalms assume that the Lord has permitted the trouble because of Israel's disobedience. But the psalmists recognize that sin can bring sickness. Therefore, he referred to the forgiveness that comes before healing. However, some psalms such as Psalm 88 and 102 acknowledge that the innocent suffering of God's people is a fact of life, no matter how hard to understand. I'm going to read Job 19, verse 14 to 26. It said, My relative have fell, and my close friend have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservant count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife, and I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. I arise and they speak against me. All my close friends abnormal me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the sin of my teeth. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O oh, you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God? Does and I not satisfied with my flesh? On that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lit forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last one on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that is my flesh, I, I shall see God. We all know the story of Job. Job lost everything, even though he lost everything, but he never gave up on God. 
he still loves God. You know, he loves them in his house, wife, the children. And because of all of this, and we see that God, uh, Job always say, I'm not going to give up because I know that my God is going to take care of me. It's going to be the same thing for the children of God. We're going to suffer in this earth. And we're going to have death, sickness, but our trust should be on God. Let me break this. Uh, when he said the, 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 the question of whether God's children should be example for, from the suffering of this world, it's a first, Christianity. We see other religion. It said, traditionally, Christianity teaches that suffering is a result of the fall of men and is heroin aspect of human life. However, to lose suffering, individual can grow spiritually, participate in Christ's suffering. Christ's suffering and look forward to redemption and eternal life. Thus, why God's children are not exempt, there is a purpose to suffering and ultimate relief in promise in the life to come. And we see the humanists, they said, from a non-religious standpoint, such as secular humanist suffering is a natural part of life. We, we all know that with no supernatural meaning of purpose, the focus is typically on reducing suffering to human effort and compassion. And we know that when we try our best, or we try in the time, our attitude toward God and very widely based on our personal belief, culture, background, religious teaching, and individual temperament. However, here are several approaches people might adopt. We need faith and trust. We see many religious encourage adherents to hold onto their faith and trust in God's plan. They believe that there is a purpose behind their suffering and that they are not alone in the struggle. We need to pray. We need to perseverance. It said resilience and perseverance. Some may view their trial as a test of character of faith. Cultivating resilience and perseverance, this attitude encourages growth and the ability to withstand adversity. We need acceptance and surrender and seeking community and support, learning and growth, act of service, hope and optimism, gratitude. It said participate and all of this is going to maintain our hope for a better future and believe that God will bring good out of even the most difficult situation. And the last thing we see in the book, it said, the Savior words have a message of comfort to those also who are suffering affliction or bereavement. Our sorrow do not spring out of the ground. But God does not afflict the wickedly, not grieve the children of men. Now the Lord of glory was dying and ransomed for the race in yielding of his precious life. Christ was not unfair by triumph, Joe. All was oppressive gloom. All of this showed that we need to stay close by Jesus' feet, even though we're going to suffer in this earth, but one day, God's going to come and then prepare us a better life. So that's the lesson that we see in this part. It's a death door. Amen. 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 I'm very glad that you mentioned uh, Job. Yes. And Job is a perfect example of the, uh, the reason why we as, we as followers of Christ suffer. <laughs> we should remember that we are uh, we are in the midst of a great controversy between Christ and Satan. And we are in the midst. Uh, so we as followers of Christ will, will suffer, will bear his cross. Also remember that Jesus as a man, Jesus as a man when he came to the earth, he suffered persecution, even the persecution up to the cross. Jesus suffered as a man. 
to save us. And we, his children, we who are followers of him, the evil one is angry with us. Right. Remember, the, there's a script here in, uh, in Revelation that says, uh, when to make war with the remnant of a seed. And we are the remnant that the, the evil one is attacking. So when suffering and pain and sickness come to us uh, as we serve the Lord, we, uh, we should look up to God for strength and praise his name that we are suffering on his behalf. Not so? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we are going to go to our next question. Uh, this question is for Pastor Dutton. What does it mean, uh, Pastor, when we see evil actions all around us without punishment and it appears that God has lost his power? <laughs> Pastor? God has lost his power. Uh, you know, uh, good morning, Sabbath school, and happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Um, I, I like the fact, first off, that um, you said it appears. It appears that God has lost his power. Um, because we all know that God never loses his power. Um, in, in the Psalms, uh, you know, we, we see especially this, this question coming up. Uh, when God's children are taken to, to Babylon and they are, are requested to sing a song. Sing us a song, they said. Their captors said. And they said, we're not going to sing. We, we, we can't sing the Lord's song in this strange land. Um, it, it's strange when we are in situations where, um, where we see that we're trying to do what is right. We are trying to live by the word of God. And then when we look around, there are wicked men and women who continue to prosper. There are individuals who don't have to think about where their next meal is coming from because they have an abundance of funds in their account. Whereas we as God's children continue to struggle. We work day in and day out trying to make ends meet. And we look around and we say, God, how can it be that I'm struggling, that I don't have enough, that I can't pay my rent, that people who I know are dying, and yet those who are doing bad are, are, are there prospering? It doesn't seem fair. Um, in fact, some may call it a scandal. A scandal. And I, I looked up the term scandal. It means an action or event regarding, regarded as mor moral or legally wrong and causing general public outrage. It's, 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 as if, it's as if we have the chief of police who sits in his house. He's the chief. He has authority to be able to command an entire group of police officers at his disposal. He sits in his house. His children does something wrong. He, we watch when the robbers come to the house. He can see them on his camera. He can see them out of his window. He sits in his chair. He allows for these robbers to come into his house. They open his door. They take his children. They take his possessions. They take his valuable assets. And he still sits there and watch it happen. He knows where they're going. He knows how to get to them. He can stop it, but he sits there and allows it to happen. So they said, this is a scandal. Who would do such a thing? God, you've got to act. And that's what the psalmist is coming up. And the psalmist is saying, this is, this is unfair. In fact, we say it's unfair. How could God allow something like this to happen? How could a police chief who knows where the criminals are going, who can see exactly their next move, who can trace them on the way and does nothing about it? How can that be? But we all know that God has to allow for our actions to have that reaction. Because our action was sinful, their action Israel was sinful, and therefore God sat back and waited. Now, we may ask many questions. Why in the world would God wait? I mean, we see it in the New Testament too. We see it in the story of Lazarus because he waited. He waited until Lazarus died and then said to the disciples, this is for God's glory. I mean, really? There are some things that make us question. Why in the world are you going to wait? 
when you can prevent this thing, you can step in right now, this instant, and prevent it from happening. And God has to show us that our actions has caused this. However, however, even though we face consequences, God lets us know that it's only for a time. The good thing about it is that he told Israel exactly the time per date when they're going to be in captivity and when they're going to be released. It's only their consequences that they face this thing. But at the end of the day, he promised that he was going to take them out. Now, the good thing about the Psalms, the Psalms tell us that when they're in that predicament, when we're in that predicament where we've done something wrong or some, some calamity has befall us, befallen us and we're in this state, that we, we call out to God. And here is what the psalmist says, that we call out and we said, God, um, don't let the enemy triumph over us. And for your name's sake, do something. It's not, it's not no longer about us and the enemies. It's now the enemies and God. God, step in for your name's sake. Vindicate your name. Step in and defend your name. And that appeals to God's reputation. Now, if we look at God's reputation, God's reputation just in the, in the book of Job, God's reputation was at stake. And God stepped in. And he didn't tell Job all of the stuff that happened in the past. All he said is, Job, where were you when I created this world? Where were you when I told the waters to stand still? Where were you when I created the whole foundation of this universe? You weren't existing. So God calls nature, he calls this universe to the extent where he says, I know what I'm doing. And I know exactly what time you're going to be free from this. And all you are called to do is to serve me. But be sure your enemies will never triumph over you because I am God. I still sit on the throne. And that's the, the hope that we have. There's a whole lot of hope in the Psalms that gives us the encouragement to know that God hasn't forgotten his people. Why? Because even though it seems like he's asleep, God is still wide awake. There's always hope for his children because he's going to take us out of this situation. Amen. 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 <laughs> God never loses his power. <laughs> it, even though it may seem that way, he never use, lose his power. He's always uh, powerful, always present, always available. Uh, he's the omnipresent God, <laughs> omnipowerful God, <laughs> omniscient. <laughs> One of our panelists is not here, but we are going to touch on uh, the question. Uh, what question three? What can we learn from the uh, re, from the psalmist's response to God's apparent absence, and how should we respond uh, to times when God does seem silent? <laughs> how should we respond to times when God seem silent? <laughs> and uh, who want to give a response to that? <laughs> Well, I could continue with that oh, yes. um, and, and, and throw, throw some things in there. Man, when God is silent, can you imagine being in the hospital, um, having your body riddled with some form of illness? It could be cancer. Yes. And you're crying out to God and saying, God, please heal me physically. Yes. And the doctor comes with even more bad news. And in those moments, it seems as if God is silent. God has forgotten. I mean, you serve your whole life. Of course, there are moments where each and every one of us go up and down uh, with our spiritual walk. But for the most part, you've always been serving God. And now you're in this predicament? I mean, and, and, and yet in those, in those instances, there are many people who, who encounter friends like Job who says, why don't you just curse God and die? Forget this thing. This religion thing, forget it. Throw it out the window. This God thing, man, just, just kick it out. There's no God. And we might be tempted to believe in those moments that God has forgotten us. But here, when God is, is seemingly absent, it's a time when we wrestle with God even more to ensure that God just give me a glimmer of hope. And in those moments, God will send us a, a response. It may be in something that we read. It may be in someone who visits that they give just a word to remind us that he hasn't forgotten. Or it could be in our memory of something that occurred in the past 
where God seemed like he was absent, but then showed up in the midst of, of our turmoil. Oh, yeah. He showed up. Yeah. And those moments when we reflect on it reminds us that God has never left us. Mm -hmm. And it's for us to continue to be faithful and to trust that God knows what he's doing. That even though we go through those times of hardship, that God does care and we can see evidence of it through our lives. Amen. Anyone else want to comment on that before we move on? Uh, if not, if not, we're going to touch on a, a question that was thrown out for anyone uh, before we go to our final panelist. And that is, does the prosperity of the wicked tempt the righteous to follow them? And when so much evil in the world seem to go unpunished, is that a challenge for righteous people? <laughs> uh, who want to touch on that? <laughs> I know we have. Okay, go ahead, Sister, Sister Viola. I know Pastor had a lot to say about this. I thought about that, especially from a little child. Uh -huh. I used to look at all the elderly people praying and praying and calling on God. But yet, there was all these problems, trial and tribulation and sickness. And I said, but... They always pray to God and saying God is going to handle this and God is going to handle that. And yet they're having all this problem. So I started to wonder as a little child myself, is God really hearing or is this just a, a, a little crutch? Hmm. And I remember my dad, he would say to me, as I, the older I was getting and he called, he would always say, don't leave out God. Don't forget God. And in my little mind, I couldn't say that to him, but I'm thinking, what is God doing for him? Because we all have all these struggles and all the problems that I was seeing and, and the difficulties. But we made choices. Our, first, our forefathers made choices. And we continue to sometimes make the wrong choices. So the wages of sin is death. He told us that. But he also told us that he would be there for us no matter what we're going through. We just have to trust him and hold tight to him. And you, I can count now as an adult how many times God has come through for me. And a lot of these trials and tribulations you're going through, there's a lesson for us. He's fine-tuning us. He's strengthening us. He's using us to be an example for others, to help others. Always there's a benefit through no matter what you're going through. So just trust in the Lord and hold tight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You want to add to yeah, that? Let me add. Let me oh, add sister, something. Yes, go ahead, I Sister Love. When it said, it said the prosperity of the wicked can be a temptation of challenge to the righteous. Mm -hmm. But it also serves as an opportunity for personal growth and reaffirmation of our own values. Mm -hmm. It can foster resilience and revelation of what constitutes true prosperity and succeed. You know, sometimes people, other people go, can be, uh, it can be something, I mean, a benediction, you know, uh, uh, for, 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 for good. And it said, it, some, we have some challenges. We can, we affirm their commitment to their value, believe that inner peace and integrity are more rewarding than the material success. Thing, you know, I was trying to, <laughs> to yeah. say when I was reading this part. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. You know, I have, I have to add to that also. Um, the, the question says, seems to go unpunished. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that, it's, that God is asleep, that he doesn't see what they have done. Um, God knows what the wicked has done. When you think about certain government officials who oppress individuals, who, who take from those who are impoverished, and live a lavish life, who are crooked, who scheme, who, who kill for power. And we have to sit back and watch all of these things unfold. I mean, I mean we, there are individuals who, who have watched family members getting killed, getting slaughtered. I think about the genocide in Rwanda, yeah, yeah. when there was a river that was so filled with so many, so many people who lost their lives that it became red from the blood of those wow, individuals. Wow. And, and, and you're wow. looking at all of these things. We've, we've seen it throughout history, even today. And we sit back and we say, God, 
Do you truly care? There's so much evil. And these things seem to go unpunished. But be sure, our God has promised that, that those who do evil, if they hurt God's people, God will turn back and vengeance will be his. So it's not for us to go out looking for vengeance. But be sure God is going to be the one to issue judgment upon those individuals. And, and guess what? If daddy issues judgment, that's judgment indeed. Um, mothers used to wait. A lot of mothers used to wait and say, you wait till daddy gets home. You wait till daddy gets home. And, 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 and be sure you know when daddy comes through that door. Once mommy says what, what, what happened, then there's going to be judgment. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And some remember those, judging, those judgment times even to this day. Mm. I don't have to go into details. <laughs> but when Jesus comes back, all of those who are unfaithful, those who have done wicked, will have to run from him. That is judgment. Amen. And we will all be inside of the city, being able to look outside and say, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's what you get because daddy's home. So be sure all we're called to do is to be faithful. But God will hold those accountable for what they have done, those atrocities that has happened, that has seemed to go unpunished. Um, but God will hold everyone accountable. And the question for a final question for the panelists, uh, Sister Viola, where should we look for answers when our faith in God is tested by trials or by people whose own suffering cause them to question the goodness and power of God. Sister Vera, take it away. Yes. Sometimes during our hardship and our suffering, we tend to forget something very important, and that's praying. I know that I have actually done that. When I was reading here, uh, Psalms um, 10, 12, Psalms 22, 1, Psalms 27, 9. I can't read all of these now, so I'm just giving you some of the ones that you can go back and read. Um, all of these points to Psalms 42, 1 through 3. David was pouring out his heart about all of what he was dealing with. But then it seemed like he remembered, back in Psalms 101, 1 through 7, that yes, he's going through a lot of suffering, and we can all identify with suffering and pain. All of us experience that at different points and time in our lives. But then he started remembering what God did for him in the past. All of us can remember things, crisis, uh, things that God spares us from, driving on the road, and this car could have hit your car. Uh, but God, Amen. The, so many different things we can call on and God was there for us so if when you're going through these rough times you're wondering where is God remember some of what God did for you in the past some of what God brought you through and know that he is going to come through for you in his time I remember hearing uh, one of my parents saying that God might be slow but he is sure and I used to look at them when I hear them saying that or other people saying that. God is going to be there. So we need to pray. When you're going through a rough time, it's time for you to press. Press closer to him. Reach out more to him. Call on him. And he will come true for us. He will come true for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Go to God and pray. And he, turn, he will provide the answers to all our situations. We have come to the end of our study this morning. Uh, may we seek God, for he is the answer, and he has the answer for all our troubles. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer as we close out. We are thankful, dear God, for your, uh, uh, for your amazing power. Oh, Father, when it seems as though uh, you are silent, oh, you're, you're still there. We are thankful, dear God, that we can run to you to find answers to our problems as we go through this life, as we go through our, our situations, as we go through our crucibles, O oh Father. Help us, dear God, to continually turn to you for help, turn to you for strength and for guidance. That's the only way we can make it through. 
We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah, no, I left it over there. But the, I think it's nine tablespoons for men, which is 36 grams or 150 calories. Now, I brought today my favorite cereal. I thought I was going to outgrow this cereal as I got older. But I have not outgrown this cereal. So I, I'm, I'm trying to outgrow this cereal. So I looked on the box to see, they said, look at the added calories, uh, added grams of sugar. How many grams do you think is in here? So it says 15. So I was like, this is great. I told Fritz, it's only 15 grams. It's not so bad. I'm doing well. He's like, 15 grams per serving. I've seen your serving. <laughs> so I they made this the writing very small for me so I could not see what the serving was so I'm good <laughs> so I want us to be mindful of the servings that we are even though it says 15 grams I've never had a 15 grams or a one serving of corn pops um, it doesn't have to be milk it doesn't have to be anything it's just corn pops on the side breakfast in the evening lunch whatever. Next slide. So it is everywhere we turn. Everywhere we turn, it's office parties and birthday parties and holidays and special days. And uh, the celebrations, just they just continue all the time. Um, so we have to think, and I, I put home in the middle because then we have to be very mindful that we don't bring some of these things home. So I'm going to say I'm not going to bring any more corn pops to my home. If I come to your home and it's there, then I may eat it, but I'm not gonna bring any more corn pops to my home. All right, so next slide. So does giving up sugar make you feel like uncomfortable? Because that's how I feel. It makes me feel like, okay, like processed sugar, I, I don't know how I'm gonna, I get nervous. My heart starts to race. It might mean that you're addicted to sugar. So it, when we eat our sugars, it's a, there's a release of dopamine. Um, they said the brain chemicals that um, sugar addicts and drug addicts have, it's the same brain chemical. It's the same brain chemical. So if we're eating a lot of sugar, we're getting that dopamine, it's hard to get away from it. Now, not everyone is addicted to sugar, but I think um, the next slide, we have to just be mindful that if you might be addicted to sugar, you might need to see a doctor. You might need to see a doctor and really, really address it. And the first thing to do is to admit it. And even in my conversation this week, I, I have known, I have tried several times, just like other uh, addicts, to let go of the sugar. It is a real, real issue for me. And I want all of us to consider if it's a real issue for you. So you don't have to be overweight. You don't have to be, look at your sugar intake. All of us need to look at our sugar intake and allow someone to hold us accountable for what we are putting into our bodies, the sugar that we're putting in. So next slide. So um, we gotta pray about it. So after you admit it, you gotta pray about it, have someone hold you accountable. Start making your own things at home, making your own you know, sweet things if you have to. Make your own granola, make your own um, acai berry bowls. Don't go out there because all of the ones that you, next slide, uh, all of the ones that you see out there, it's loaded, uh, laden with sugar. It's, it's just too much sugar. Even your smoothies that you're getting out there, laden with sugar. We have to. So, so I'm going to go to my almost last slide. Um, first thing to do, don't go to cold turkey. Um, I've tried it. It's better to do something that's really sustainable. Eat a balanced meal. Eat a balanced meal. Um, that will help. I know I have a little not so great thing to do, which is I feel like I need a little sweet treat after every meal. Really, really bad habit. Um, if you're drinking water, add a, add a little sweet fruit to it. So, and eat whole fruit. 
don't have, if you like apples, don't drink apple juice unless you're making your own apple juice. Don't eat applesauce. Actually eat an apple as to, to try to address your sweet, uh, sweet tooth. Um, check your magnesium level. I'm gonna, starting to take a little magnesium to see if that will address my sweetness, my sweet uh, tooth. And then go on a 21-day detox. So if anyone would like to join me on a 21, uh, I thought, okay, I could do like a seven-day detox. I think I'll probably um, have a challenge there. But if anyone wants to uh, do that with me, I welcome you to, to join me. I'm not ready yet, but because I have some things that are coming up, but um, that my last slide is to pray always. Um, so if anyone wants to pray with me, uh, and I'll pray with you as we uh, get through this, the sweet tooth that we, we have. And I pray that you'll all um, be considerate of the challenges that we have with our sugar intake. Thank you so much. Thank you.